Hello, everybody, and welcome to Carbon Removal Newsroom for Thursday, April 6th. Today, we have Toby Bryce, who works on CDR policy and advocacy with the Open Air Collective. Hi, Toby. Hello, Radhika. Thank you for having me on your program. Uh, we always like having you. And then, as always, this is Radhika Mugakar, head of supply at Nori. Today, we're going to try something a little different and um, not have a panel, but we are spinning up kind of a new series that is going to talk in depth with people who are in, engaged in community outreach, community development uh, of projects in carbon removal generally. So we're launching with Toby, partially because Toby is in the trenches and partially because he is given a, a lot of thought on this, so we're excited to kind of hear his perspective. Um, a year ago, he was on the show, and he works, If those for those of you who don't know, he works with the voluntary volunteer advocacy group, the Open Air Collective, on a whole host of projects that support the growth of carbon removal. Toby told us about the groups working to advocate for state-level legislation called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act that was passed in New York State. Since then, the legislation has been proposed in several more states, and the group's network of policy advocates has grown along with it. Today, we'll talk a little bit about the CDRLA and what kind of political dynamics he's found as the open air wades into state-level policymaking, and also touch upon public acceptability and the challenges of growing carbon removal. How do we balance both the needs of advocates and the urgency of this problem? So first off, Toby, let's just start on on an update on CD CDRLA outreach, the status of the state bills and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess to just sort of set the stage, um, open air, um, you know, one of our pillars is policy development and advocacy. And we do a lot of thinking and work at the state and local level. And we think that's really important. Obviously, federal policy can be larger and more impactful, um, but it's also slower and um, and you know in our current political environment, it's a little bit indeterminate how much more federal policy we'll be able to get. Um, however, we think the state um, and local jurisdictions are incredibly um, fertile ground for working on policy, and that's for a couple reasons. Number one, we have fifty states and and numerable. Um, number of local governments. And so we think that there's a lot of opportunity for innovation um, and to think about new policies and, and really just the, you know more shots on goal and get, get more policies passed. Um, the other piece of it is that, again, like federal policy can be really impactful, but also with federal policy, you end up with kind of larger unitary policies that give us things like DAC hubs, which you know are really important and I think are going to be really great for taking the DAC um, the DAC sector forward, but we think that carbon removal is strongest when it's, the sector will be strongest if we can be as broad-based as possible um, in terms of geography and also carbon removal method and approach. And so like if you have a state level policy where you can have, again, more shots on goal, that will fund a broader range of projects than I think federal policy is really set up to do. So those are the reasons we really like state policy. The CDRLA is a bill that we wrote to kind of, one, is our, really our first state level carbon removal bill. And it's uh, designed to set up a state level um, CDR procurement program. Um, the bill is a live bill in New York. It's a little bit more abundant in New York. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, it was introduced er earlier this year by the Senate Majority Leader in Massachusetts, Cindy Cream, who is amazing, super powerful. She completely gets carbon removal and how it fits into our, our kind of climate toolkit. And uh, so the bill has been introduced there. Um, in terms of the status, there's an initial hearing, uh, I believe, next Tuesday, April 11th, um, we have a great roster of panelists, Greg Nemet, um, folks from 4401, Running Tide, uh, uh, Heirloom, Verdox, um, uh, Frontier, um, who are going to come and talk to the, the, the legislators about carbon removal generally, not really the bill specifically, but to kind of set the stage for passing the bill. So, um, you know, that's where the policy is in Massachusetts. We think it's in a really good place. Um, uh, New York is, is a politically challenging environment. There are a lot of other climate policies pending. Um, we're kind of trying to pursue a more uh, executive approach by working with the governor's office on potentially a smaller pilot project in New York. No real news to report there yet. 
uh, a couple other states where things are happening. We have two bills being advanced in Colorado. One is a sort of a study bill to create sort of a research uh, and experimental initiative around um, plugging orphan oil and gas wells with biochar, which is really interesting. And then there's another bill that's a more general carbon removal bill that would allow carbon removal projects to qualify under the more general rubric of state clean tech funding. So those are two kind of interesting bills happening in Colorado. And then in California, there's a super innovative and interesting bill that's been introduced by Senator Josh Becker, um, who's kind of from the peninsula Silicon Valley area. And it's called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Market Development Act, the CDRM. DA, if we would like to go acronymic. And that bill also has a hearing, I believe, week after next. Um, and it is a different structure than the um, uh, the CDRLA procurement bill. It's more of a compliance mechanism, and it's setting up a polluter pays compliance market for carbon removal along the lines of kind of the low carbon fuel standard and the CCA um, compliance markets in California. So that's the kind of the top line. I'm happy to kind of dig into any of those that, that you'd like to drill into. Yeah, I think I'm just more curious uh, to start with about why you've chosen slightly different strategies or how you have chosen the strategies you've chosen in each state. So it sounds like the Northeast, you're going with sort of the CDRLA, this procurement model. Then in Colorado, you're looking at a slightly different model. Uh, and then in California, yet another model. So yep. Uh, is that by design or is that in response to the political environment or some combination? I think a combination. I mean, I think, you know, when you're looking at local state and local policy, you really have to think about what the local politics are. Um, the CDRLA is a bill that we wrote. Um, California and New York are both Democratic super majorities. Um, so the politics there are very different from Colorado, which is more of a red state, which kind of, or sorry, purple state, that which requires that you start in a little bit more modest terms, which those bills are. And then California is a politically, obviously, very dynamic and heterogeneous state. <clears throat> and California already has this market-based infrastructure for for um, for carbon. So um, those bills we have collaborated on, but I wouldn't say we were the primary authors of the bills in Colorado or California. Um, we're very supportive of both, and we're working on getting uh, membership together for citizen lobbying for both bills. Um, the CDRLA is kind of, it, it's like most philosophically aligned with how we think. It's a its a method neutral criteria-based procurement bill. Um, it starts very small, 10,000 tons a year, and then um, increases by 10,000 tons each year over its initial five-year authorization. So it goes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 tons. Um, you know, if it passes this year, it would start in 2024. And, uh, and you know, there's a 10-year delivery period. The projects have to be in-state or likely by an in-state carbon removal company. Um, and so it's really designed to, um, you know, it's obviously going to deliver some climate benefit, but it's really from a political perspective, it's packaged as an innovation and commercial development policy. Um, we've kind of found that for a state level government, you know, it's hard to sell the purely climate narrative. Um, so you really need to think like, why would, you know, New York or Massachusetts spend this, spend this money on this project when the federal government's also doing it. So you really need to um, kind of um, think about it in terms of building, you know, enabling the given jurisdiction to be able to participate in what is, you know, as we all know, is going to be a, you know, multi a trillion dollar sector later this century. So as, as the Open Air Collective and, and your the groups that you work with are looking um, to work within states, how are you choosing the states you work with or how are you figuring out who to partner with um, as you know, you move these move these bills forward across the country? Yeah. Well, open or as you mentioned, open air is an all volunteer organization. No one gets paid. Um, and it's so it's very member driven. So, you know, and I would say this to the audience, too, if anyone is living in a state and wants to, like, collaborate on a carbon removal policy for your state or join any any of our work in the states where we're active, please, you know, we'll put a link in the show notes, but join our group. Uh, it's very member driven. So, you know, if someone in North Carolina or Texas or Louisiana wanted to start a carbon removal policy, we kind of have the tools and infrastructure to get something like that started. But it starts with the people. It starts with the volunteers. So New York, I mean, I happen to be in New York. Um, Chris Nidal, our, our co-founder, is, is from Albany, so and very well connected politically in, in the state. So that's kind of where we started. Massachusetts, literally, I... You know, I saw Senator Cream. She's sponsoring another policy that we developed called the Low Embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act, which is a state-level policy for public procurement of low-carbon concrete. So we sort of knew her, but 
Massachusetts has kind of an interesting situation. Um, both New York and Massachusetts have net zero policies that are net zero by 2050, 85% from emissions reductions, and then 15% from other kind of poorly, poorly defined offsets. And in New York, that's kind of where it stopped. But in Massachusetts, interestingly, they had actually done the work to estimate of that 15%, how much um, sequestration can they get out of their natural and working lands? So that kind of like eliminated the conflict between, um, you know, longer duration carbon removal and forests and soils because they had already figured that piece out. So they think they can get eight to 10 percent of uh, their 15 percent, you know, offset segment of their net zero commitment from natural and working lands, leaving five to seven percent of, uh, of, you know, they need to solve. And I actually saw a statement that Senator Freeman made saying that we need to like develop carbon removal for this final sprint of our net zero commitment. And I saw that and I, I messaged her on Twitter and she replied right away and said, contact my uh, policy director, Garrett Casey, who, by the way, is amazing. He, he's like, get so much done. And we're only one of I don't know how many different pieces of legislation he's working on. Mm -hmm. So it's again, it's just very member driven. And 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 then you have to be very, you know, a carbon removal policy in Arizona is going to look very different from a carbon removal policy in Massachusetts, just because of the local political context. And then they're also kind of leg legislative and legal context. Not every state has a net zero commitment. So you kind of have to think about it in a different way there. And again, California is its own beast. It's, you know, it would be the one of the largest countries in the world if it were its own country. So it's, you know, it's got very, I think, specific politics. <laughs> That's a kind way of putting it after having lived in California for four years. Um, so I, I'm curious a little bit about the Colorado bill, because that's actually the first bill that's kind of in a purple state that you've talked about in in depth. And I'm curious, um, what kind of what are the political dynamics in a purple state? And where are the areas where you're seeing unexpected cooperation and unexpected maybe lack of cooperation? Um, first of all, I'm not super plugged into our Colorado work, so I am probably not the best person to talk in detail about Colorado, but I can say a few things. Um, yes, Colorado is a purple state. I think we started kind of trying to pitch present a CDRLA state level public procurement framework there, and it just didn't get anywhere. I think there were some issues with the state budget or no, the state constitution in terms of how the state procures goods and services that made it complicated given the, you know, from the structure that we had developed for New York and Massachusetts. Um, and then more generally, it just wasn't a policy that got a lot of traction. Um, so we did, you know, we had to look in other directions. Um, we do have a couple of great um, partners in government in Colorado. There are a couple of um, state legislators we've become close to. Uh, the head of sustainability for Boulder County, Susie Strife, who is one of the founders of the Four Corners Carbon Coalition, which is a local government um, CDR procurement program that Open Air kind of helped get off the ground. And so we, you know, we talked to them and tried to figure out um, what was the best way to get started. They it was suggested, um, and this actually came from the local legislator there, um, that you know one problem is that there is money for clean tech in Colorado, but carbon removal projects can't qualify. So we just decided to start by making it so that carbon removal projects can qualify for this more general pool of funding and see if that can get passed and go from there. I think getting something passed, you know, I think that you know, in politics, obviously, it's the art of the possible, as they say. You don't want to let the um, the the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just to load on the cliches here, um, and you know, I think you have to be really pragmatic and practical when you're thinking about these things. So, where did the idea for biochar as a lid, or you know, for the for the mines come from? Because that seems like pretty innovative and yeah. No, it's a super cool idea. Um, it, it came from the academic literature. We have a member in Colorado who um, we actually uh, we, we did a seminar where she presented and, and she kind of had a personal issue that got her really interested in how to plug orphan oil and gas wells because of a health issue with a family member from the um, some of the contaminants that came from the orphan oil and gas wells. And she just got interested in it and, and you know, she was part of open air. And, and again, we kind of have this like framework and support structure so that an individual who has an idea like this can kind of take it and run. And now it's a, you know, it's a live bill in the legislator, le legislature. And um, again, it's a really modest policy. It's, it's a study bill. It basically gets the state to start looking into this. Um, you know, I, 
the, there are so you know there are millions of orphan oil and gas wells in in um, in North America and the U.S. and they're a huge source of of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is just one way that that you can potentially um, solve that problem. It's really creative. I I love it because it's so practical. <laughs> yeah. And I can um, give I can give you guys some some little information on that bill that you can put in the show notes. And if again, if anyone's interested in following up on that, definitely reach out to us and we can kind of hook you up with that team. And obviously there are other states where that kind of policy could potentially be advanced because there are orphan oil and gas wells all over our country, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so how about in the more like you said, the democratic supermajority states? What what kind of resistance or political dynamics do you see in those states? Um, well, number one, and the biggest one, I think, for any policy advocacy is just inertia, um, getting mind share with legislators. There's just so much going on. You know, climate's important, but so is crime or education or all these other policies Housing. that folks are working on. And, and so number one is like finding a good sponsor and getting mind share because it's just hard to, you know, you have to get a committee hearing and then once you're through committee, you have to get a vote and all of that just takes legis, you know, that takes legislator interest. So that is really the, by I think far in a state like New York and Massachusetts, the biggest problem. Um, New York, there are a dozen climate policies pending. There's some really good bills that couldn't even get a vote last year because of just like intransigence in Albany. So, um, so, you know, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest challenge. And for Massachusetts, I mean, we're really fortunate to have such a, you know, plugged in, in tune and powerful sponsor in Senator Cream. And, and I think that that gives me a lot of hope for our prospects in Massachusetts. Um, beyond that, really, you know, it's not like you're going to get Republicans super interested in, in this policy um, in a state like New York or Massachusetts. Um, but in Massachusetts, they're actually, uh, the Republican Party in New York is kind of um, a, a little bit of a... Uh, it's in a little bit of disarray, I would say, in a variety of ways. But in Massachusetts, there are actually some relatively reasonable Republicans who are interested in climate. So I am. I think we could potentially get bipartisan sponsorship in Massachusetts. Um, again, we're just getting started, and we haven't really started rolling out our effort to um, to uh, attract other legislative sponsors. So we're kind of early days in Massachusetts. But the biggest, I think, opposition is on the sort of environmental left, where you have a lot of kind of old guard environmental organizations that are really suspicious of quote unquote carbon capture. They don't understand the difference between carbon removal and carbon capture. Um, you have some sort of like folks who've drank the Mark Jacobson Kool-Aid that we can get everything done with solar and wind and we don't need any other technologies. So that's kind of the, the challenge there. And what I've found is that some, you're not going to be able to win some people over, but the way to to kind of win over that point of view is to try to have um it's also hard to have group to group conversations because like groups are kind of monolithic and it's hard to kind of they have hard positions and they can be kind of dogmatic but you try to find influential people within the groups that are potentially open to new ideas and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I've really found that the best way to unlock the door when someone might not agree with you with respect to carbon removal is just like go overboard and correctly, frankly, that you know emissions reductions are the lion's share of the work that we need to do as a you know society to reach net zero. Um, I always reference the science-based targets numbers, which are 90% from emissions reductions and then 10% from carbon removal. Um, if we do well, it could be less from carbon removal. If we can get more from natural and working lands, it could be less from longer duration carbon removal. But if you really start like a couple people who with whom I've had this conversation, it's like, I really like to hear you say that 90% number. So I found that that first, first of all, I believe it. And second of all, and I think it's correct. And second of all, I think that's one thing that I found really, really helps like open people up to this conversation. And then number two is to disambiguate carbon capture from carbon removal. Um, you could have a whole nother episode on carbon capture because, you know, someone, uh, Jack Andreessen from uh, Breakthrough said on Twitter today, carbon capture is not going to be important for energy um, generation because we're it's just not going to make sense to put clean coal makes no sense. But carbon capture will be needed for industrial things like cement and steel, most likely. But regardless, you know, and it may or may not be a good techno-economic situation, given whatever that particular context is, but it's not carbon removal. So if you can kind of get folks to understand that carbon carbon capture, quote unquote, is different than carbon removal, um, that's the second thing that I found helpful. 
The third thing that I found helpful is to really emphasize that carbon removal does not equal giant carbon engineering direct air capture plants, but rather it's a range of pathways and approaches, everything from forests and soils to you know, biochar and bio oil. People don't like it when you say bio oil, so I usually just say biochar. Um, talk about ocean-based methods, um, mineralization. I mean, there's no one on the planet who doesn't like enhanced rock weathering. So like emphasize these other approaches, Direct air capture is part of the puzzle, certainly, but you know there are all these other approaches. So but those are kind of the three things that I think we found that can help convince people. And you're not going to win everybody over, but we've had some wins. And in Massachusetts, we're having those conversations now. We've um, been set up with kind of one-on-ones with local environmental organizations in Massachusetts. We're organizing a sort of a private environmental justice roundtable to kind of present the policy and listen. And, you know, and the fact in Massachusetts is the bills, you know, it's a legislative draft. We're open to feedback or listening, you know. So I think the key is to like, to be really humble and just try to listen to what people have to say. And then those three kind of, um, I found those three primary points to make have been sometimes effective in getting people to be open to the idea of carbon removal. So uh, another area that I've heard a lot of concern about, which I don't know if these if your three strategies alleviates is the, you know, the, the feeling that the extracted, the communities that most were most hurt by the extractive industries will be again, most hurt because that's where like long-term storage will happen. And therefore there will be injections and things like that. Yeah. And so, um, and frankly, you know, I think they have an interesting perspective because they have been the most impacted and why should they trust what anyone's saying? But we don't have time to convince them in some ways nope. because it's so important. So how do you approach you know, that part of the environmental justice um, <clears throat> community, which also seems to maybe be less in the political sphere and more in the advocacy, like grassroots sphere? Yep. And I think that's a really good point because I, I would say the, you know, the environmental left is not monolithic. You do have these sort of incumbent um, old guard environmental organizations, and then you have the actual frontline communities. And there's definitely some overlap between those two segments of the environmental lap left, but they're pretty distinct. They're coming to this from a pretty distinct point of view. Um, you know, through this work, I've had the fortune and to like be able to sit down in roundtable situations with um, really some of the most like prominent environmental justice leaders in the U.S., Peggy Shepard, Dr. Beverly Wright from Louisiana, Catherine Flowers from Alabama. And you again, you just have to like sit down, be quiet and listen. Um, and you, that's what you hear from 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 folks like that. They they've you know, they, their communities have borne the brunt of of, you know, industrialization for the past century plus. And one of one, one, I remember one comment was very impactful to me um, that, you know, y'all need to not be doing your science experiments in our backyard. Um, and we don't, you know, we have our own experts. We don't trust your experts because they've been hearing these things for, for decades and generations. And what I come down to is, okay, um, you know, this is a new industry. We have the opportunity to do it right. We're going to have to earn communities trust. And you know, we need to, we, we, the, you know, the extractive fossil carbon economy, the industrial economy was built in a very inequitable way. And we absolutely have to do better this time. And I think it comes down to consent-based siting. Let's not put projects where they're not wanted. Um, and I think we're going to talk about this a little more, but like if you're a carbon removal company, the first thing you need to do before you pick a site, you need to have potential sites, and then you need to engage with the communities at those sites. Um, XPRIZE and Carbon 180 just put out an amazing resource called From the Ground Up, and the title says it all. You just need to do these things first. And I, you know, my day job is I'm a commercial advisor and I work with some carbon removal companies, and that can be hard because it's hard to understand exactly how to do it. No one knows exactly how to do it. Um, you have folks out there like, you know, Dr. Holly Buck, who are experts in this, who've been studying it for, for many years in an academic setting. And you can definitely read their work and, and you know, Simone Stewart, Selena Scott Buchler from um, Data for Progress, uh, Vanessa Suarez and Anu Khan from Carbon 180. Like there's a lot of resources out there, but you know, I think everyone's flying blind a little bit, but you have to you have to do it that way. I think that again, like the the X Prize Carbon 180 document, which just came out pretty recently, it's called From the Ground Up, and it's a kind of an initial attempt at a playbook for a carbon removal company to how to how do you confront these issues? How do you do this? And I will say that 
it's one of the nice things about working in carbon removal is that it's a lot of good people. And I think everyone is very well intentioned in this regard and people want to do the right thing. So I think that, you know, we just have to kind of, we have to, um, I think, again, it's consent-based siting and, and from the ground up. Yeah, I have, uh, you know, two thoughts about this though. I would say that one, I think one interesting approach if some of these communities could figure out a way to do it is you're seeing here in the Pacific Northwest, the native tribes taking control of the CDR and becoming actually the people creating it, controlling it, building businesses around it. And so, you know, sometimes I wonder if the tribe, if the communities that have been most impacted actually had control over the businesses in some way, whether they were life, you know, creating them or creating yeah. the, or owning the electricity, which is happening in the native tribes in Canada, that helps them come to the table and have a better understanding and actually get a financial benefit from it too. Um, my other just general thought is I think there are some playbooks out there that we aren't looking at in the CDR industry, like affordable housing and other parts, which has not gone well, but you can learn a lot from what not to do if you follow like affordable housing and homeless shelters and, and the opposition that they raise on the worst ways to do it and like yeah you know the traditional playbooks and how they don't work and um you know i think you can translate a lot a lot of stuff from other areas into cdr in this very specific space of community outreach yeah um but i would so i want i do go ahead when the um just to your community the, the with the um the tribal communities i think that's a really important concept um there was a i think it was in new republic but um we can I can check and we can put it in the show notes. But there was a really good article. I don't agree with everything the article said, but there was a really good article about community-based CDR and um, getting you know communities to take ownership of projects. And one thing we specifically um, included in the CDRLA legislative text is something we called the small project allowance. So we basically reserved a certain amount of the procurement that would come to projects that were smaller than I can't remember the number, but I think a thousand tons. So that I mean, obviously you can't do all small projects but you know we tried to create a reserve so that you know there 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 are mechanisms in in the bill so that all the procurement doesn't go to just a couple projects yeah. and i think this idea and i think that's another reason that local and um state level policy is important because it's impractical for federal policy to like to to incentivize and well they can incentivize but to actually procure really small projects but i do think that at the local government again the four corners carbon coalition model and at the state level procurement programs i think that's a great way to actually support these projects so i think that really would be a amazing thing if that can be part of uh, of the sector going forward yeah so i uh you know like final sort of topic area i wanted to sort i wanted to touch on you know how you imagine it best for us this us being the CDR industry generally to build a community forward model and Project Bison in Wyoming is probably the first at least well documented attempt at doing CDR outreach and I I would say it you know it might have been mixed there seems to be still a lot of hesitation from the community within Wyoming or at least some parts of the community but certainly from the descriptions you hear and read about it seemed like the the companies really made a lot of effort to do it correctly, but even the name became a problem, right? Like bison somehow caused some anxiety and irritation within ex within the community that they were citing this. So yeah. I'm curious, Toby, as you've been working with in the trenches, as you've been working with these different groups, what you, what you think a small CDR and working with small CDR companies, what should they do and how do they do it when they're startups, limited budgets, limited resources, but yep. they have the best of intentions. Yeah, I think Project Bison is a good example. I mean, they, I don't, they certainly, I'm sure there's no way they could have done everything perfectly, but there was a genuine, there's a genuine belief in that company that that they do want to do the right thing and they do want to engage with the community. Um, some of the press coverage I thought was a little bit unfair. It was sort of the journalistic, like we found one person for it and one person against it. I don't think those are the actual percentages. Um, again, shouting out to Data for Progress, they they did some amazing polling in, in Wyoming about carbon removal, and it was like plus 41% favorability. So I think a relatively significant majority of, of, uh, of, you know, 
residents of Wyoming are, are supportive, any local project is going to have issues. And one example, um, you know, the the community Rock Springs area in Wyoming where the project's happening, and this isn't directly related to Project Bison, but they had a problem with their solar farms because the solar farms were um, were interrupting the the normal migration patterns for pronghorn antelope, and I think potentially diverting them onto the interstate, which is a problem. And like, but it's a solvable problem. You can create corridors through the solar farm. So like, you know, but that was kind of brought in some of the coverage. Like this was a something that 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 Project Bison was responsible for. So I think that um, you know, I think that a lot of times there will definitely be issues that will be surfaced, but um, you know, I think that they can be dealt with. But I would point people, and, and I think that Data for Progress also has some really great, more in-depth research coming up. Um, they've uh, had a team out um, looking at, I think, four different communities in the U.S., including Wyoming, and doing some really great field work. And I don't believe it's been published yet, but um, I think that's going to be a really useful document for people to read. More generally for carbon removal companies, I'm just going to go back and not to be boring, but just the consent-based siting um, and uh, and meet, you know, do make that not, number one on your to-do list when you're siting. Um, I think that it's the right thing to do. It's morally correct, but it's also good business because you don't want to be in a community where you're not wanted. It's just, it's going to make it hard to find people to work for you. It's going to make it more expensive. Things are going to take longer. If people don't want you there, people have power. People can stop projects. Dr. Beverly Wright's um, group in Louisiana just stopped a giant petrochemical plant. Um, not just, but a couple months ago. So I just think that, that again, consent-based siting and from the ground up, do this first when you're siting. And um, obviously, you know, I do have sympathy for, for, a carbon removal company, because I can see it from that side too. There are a lot of things to do. It's not like, you know, it's not like the, the sector is super profitable at this point. Um, no one has revenues to speak of. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, engaging early um, and listening is really important. You know, and I think, you know, I think that communities have to be reasonable about things like community benefits agreements. It's, the, these projects are not rich. You know, they, they're not going to have a tremendous amount of extra, um, you know, margin to 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 throw around. Um, that said, I do think any any, um, you know, any any carbon removal project of reasonable size should have some level of community benefit agreement. And um, and you should try to hire local 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 businesses and local employees. You should try to hire union employees where possible. So like, I think there are a lot of things that, that you know, that a carbon removal project can do. Um, but I think it all starts with just engaging upfront, early listening and, um, you know, ultimately consent-based siting. And these, so these should be, I mean, it's not like, it's also the carbon removal, most carbon removal approaches don't have significant negative externalities. They should be the kinds of projects that people want in their communities if they're presented properly, if, if you listen to what the communities say, and you're able to kind of, you know, deliver benefits. And with consent-based siting, is that something you see as separate prior to any sort of permitting action? So if, do you, or is that part of the permitting process? Because oftentimes there's a whole community outreach in that yeah. process as well. Yeah, I think it's more of a... <clears throat> It, it, it's more of a general concept, I would say, because um, I do think, you know, through the permitting process, if a community really doesn't want something, they have a, some opportunity to stop it or to make it more difficult or more costly. But I think philosophically, it's 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 a, it's a pretty important term. Um, I mean, practically speaking, too, you know, a car, when you're even for uh, one of the companies I work with does terrestrial biomass sequestration, biomass burial. And it's not like you're building a giant DAC plant, but you know, there are going to be some disturbances to the community, at least temporarily. So, you know, I think that just like socializing those with the people who live around where you're going to do this work, even if it's temporary, is important. And it's also it's commercially, it's good business because you're going to find other people who are interested in this if you present it well. And um you know, and practically speaking, a lot of these things are going to have to happen in parallel. You're going to have to investigate, you know, permitting, you're going to have to file. So it's not like you have to, it, there's not like a, I don't think there's a specific like checkpoint getting quote unquote consent from the community, but I do think engaging in that initial stage is important. 
And again, I think we're all kind of feeling this out. I'm definitely not the the expert on this. Um, uh, the, some of those names I mentioned earlier have done some really good thinking on this. So I think there are a lot of good resources out there. And you know, there are just not that many good models because it's a new sector. Um, so yeah. I think that you know, I think that we're all going to be learning as we go along. I think my uh, the final question I would ask you, and then um, I will leave you to your evening, uh, is pipelines. This one is particularly a question I have is, you know, people don't want pipelines in their backyards. Uh, and so it's bringing together interesting coalitions of folks. And so when you're looking at something like that, that really doesn't maybe have a community benefit for that parcel of land, but might be necessary for a broader community benefit. You know, have you seen any successful models yet addressing those types of concerns? I think the successful model with pipelines is to avoid them. Um, cite your, first of all, again, as we, as you well know, carbon removal is a range of pathways and approaches, most of which don't have anything to do with pipelines. So it's a relatively small number of, oh, it's actually a very small number, direct air capture and, and BEX, um, or certain bikers pathways where you're capturing the CO2, um, uh, require pipelines. I mean, the first thing I would do is cite those projects on top of your sequestration, like Climeworks has done in Iceland. And that's not going to be possible forever. And pipelines are going to be potentially necessary if, you know, carbon, if you need to retrofit an existing cement plant with, with, um, with carbon capture, but that's again, not carbon removal. Um, I do think that like pipelines are obviously extremely difficult. They're extremely expensive. I think at this early stage, you know, I think that maybe there will be pipeline infrastructure with some of the DAC hubs. That's more of a kind of large scale infrastructure development question. Um, there are some small number of existing pipelines that could be leveraged. Um, I know that some carbon removal company, some, some direct air capture companies are looking to site adjacent to existing pipeline infrastructure. So I guess my number, my three step would be avoid pipelines if you can. You're probably not going to be able to avoid them forever, but I do think with early deployments, I think that there will be a reasonable opportunity to avoid pipelines. I mean, there might be like site level pipelines where, you know, you're right. moving carbon CO2 around the site, but I just think the idea of building long pipelines is just, it's very difficult, I would say. Well, Toby, with that, I really thank you for being our inaugural guest as we start to think about these issues in more depth. And I really appreciate your time and your insights and uh, look forward to seeing how all your different initiatives move forward. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I am a huge fan of the show. I listen to every episode. So. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Toby, I appreciate that.